You're sitting in the back room of a theater, dressed in heavy black robes, your luscious red hair contained by a thick hood, nibbing on an iced coffee. Behind you, an imbos positioned next to the door, with a professional expression, trying his damnness to not as much as look at you. The silence in the room occasionally interrupted by the sounds of your drinking. You had awoken early today. It wasn't often that you were called for a job. There was a certain anxiousness that you felt. Mistakes, blunders, screwing up. The theatrics always made you feel terrible for weeks. Though it had been a while since the last time you did that. Nonchalantly, you began expecting your right wrist. As if the little hidden claw beneath your skin had vanished since the last time you checked. Pressing on a barely visible skin pouch, the black stinger shot out of your skin. It was a shiny obsidian black. A tiny, almost unnoticeable hole at its furthest tip. You had tried stabbing yourself with it once, though it seemed like you were immune to your own power. It just really hurt. Five more minutes, Miss Blackwall, said the imp after checking his watch. You attracted the stinger by fully straightening your hand. It was good that you purposefully needed to touch the little skin pouch, otherwise this thing could have been quite inconvenient when it came to personal contacts, as well as sleeping. You leaned back in your chair, sighing loudly. When had it been again? Two days ago? Four? Perhaps a week. That was your minimum requirement for your recruitment contracts, though you had trouble keeping up with dates. You lived at the top floor of an amazing apartment tower, right in the middle of the gang territory of Carmilla Carmine though you didn't have any preferences when it came to the overlords. After all, you needed to remain neutral, part of the job. Camilla just had more classy accommodations than most, and she always was a little more generous when it came to jobs. Really, sometimes you saw yourself as her third daughter with how well she treated you. Of course, you never say that out loud or to her face. She slit your tongue. You had lazily been drifting in and out of sleep when the call came. You had been lying on an inflatable mattress inside your pool. For the great luxury you experienced in hell, you were expected to jump onto any job. That's why you were here. The five minutes were over, and the imp opened the door, allowing you passage. Like the image of death itself, you made your way through a dim yet lavishly decorated hallway, covered in posters of plays and movies you had never seen. Most of them hell productions, though some of them, such as Casablanca, came from Earth. After taking your final breath, you stepped onto the stage. Your first look went over the audience. Only a handful of the most powerful overlords had gathered. Most of them sitting in the front row, aside from two of them. Hmm, let's see. Who's here? There were the V's, all three of them. Rosie, of course. Zessiel never skipped a performance. Two members of the Eldritch family, and far in the back, sitting with a young blonde woman, said... Alistair the Radio Demon? Ah, uh, you haven't seen him in seven years. Ah, uh, good to see an old friend. Well, friend wasn't really the right word. Acquaintance? Finally, your eyes went over the person chained on a singular chair in the middle of the stage, all lights of the theater pointing at them. It was a woman. She had beautiful orange skin blue lips and blonde hair. She was dressed like one of Valentino's girls, with white freckles and green eyes. You remained out of sight of her, while everyone else was staring at you with bated breaths. 
What was happening here? This wasn't a play. No. You approached the chained woman from behind. She shivered and started screaming as she finally noticed you. Gently you slid the back of your hand down her cheek. Patiently, Rosie leaned forward, taking out her theater glasses to exactly see the facial reactions of the bound woman. A loud popping noise rang through the theater as Valentina opened a bottle of alcohol. But everyone was too enamored by what was happening on stage to be bothered by it. This wasn't a play. No. This was an execution. The demoness before you must have committed a grave sin that presumably all overlords gathered here desired this woman's demise, or at least democratically agreed on this being proper punishment. Well, considering Alistair was sitting still in the theater, there was the certain exception that he was just here for sick pleasure and would have agreed to any execution. To stop the woman screaming, you placed her hand on her chin, clapping her jaws shut. You inspected her carefully. She was a very basic demoness, sinner born, no special features aside from her discolored skin and strange looking eyes, looking a little like those of horses. She had two small horns poking out of her forehead. They had signs of being cut. Who was it again who ordered her to be executed? Aya hey, Vox, right, the TV demon. Just in case your eyes started over to him, he was leaning forward in his chair, his mouth was turned into a vile grin. Eyes not even blinking. Well, better not keep the audience waiting. The tension could be cut with a knife. Besides, this wasn't your first time in this specific place of execution. Normally it was some dingy serial killer like basement or an interrogation room beneath a nightclub. Each overlord having their own execution place. Vox, the TV demon, was one for theatrics, so perhaps that's why he used this old opera-style theater for it. I'm going to explain what will happen to you. Even though you spoke directly into the ear of your victim, everyone in the theater heard your voice. It was thanks to the microphone attached to the rope given to you by Vox. I don't know why you have been called for execution. Nor do I care. Remain quiet. This will make the process more easy on all of us. Your grip on the woman's chin slowly lessened. While she stopped screaming in fear, she now threw herself against her restraints, but to no avail. The chair was bolted to the floor, her powers, if she had any, suppressed by her shackles. You shook your head. Well, to be fair, you were dead the second they put me on this, you muttered. No point in fighting. So about this. See, sometimes tearing a soul apart is enough for dear makers. Sometimes they want a more permanent solution. You're probably wondering how. Chuckling, you hugged her from behind, placing your chin on her shoulder and smiling. See, we have to be creative down here in H E double L. Physical harm is out of the question, as that only leads to regenerations. The same thing goes with poison, eventually it's out of the system. Smirking, you kissed her neck. Her skin tasted pleasant, was quite warm. Such a shame. For a moment you forgot you were in the theater. Sharing an intimate moment with the woman you are about to kill. But there are other means. Addiction is a really popular one. Sometimes forced. Practically always forced if we use it as an execution method. Uh, Zestiel's adopted daughter can make you want to self-delete over and over again whenever you regenerate. Though technically you can recover from that. And if you can suppress it enough, you can live... A miserable life, after decades, maybe. 
and then there's memory removal. It's one that Carmilla really likes to use, but... Your hands move down to the woman's curvy body. My niece worries. You let go of her, walking around her, until you're face to face with her. You're pressed into the skin pouch, your stinger shooting out. It glistened in the stage lights. See, memory removal still technically allows the gaining of new memories. Of a new self. New person. Sure, the demon might be reduced to a newborn intelligence and knowledge-wise, but you can come back from that eventually. And in very rare cases, the memories just suddenly return. That is a possibility. Even though memory parasites devour the memories whole, it just happens. You went down on one knee, placing both hands on her thighs, making sure to scrape her skin with the stinger as you did. What I do, you can never come back from. You said in a serious tone while staying right into her eyes, and then you smiled up at her. Tell me, sweetie, what is your best personality trait? Uh, what? She hushed. To her, this felt more. To her, this felt very out of context, but it was important. I, I suppose I'm quite self-sufficient. Well, at least she taught you an extra personality trait. It was rare that in hell somebody actually told you a personality trait. Ugh. Gently you patted her left knee with your right hand. Good answer. With an evil grin you stood up and walked behind her again. And you gently brushed the back of your fingers against her cheek. Soon this will all be over. But don't worry. I seldom get any complaints. The girl's eyes contracted out of fear. Placing her left onto her head. She froze. Her gaze forward. And finally. You placed the long black stinger against her neck. Her body wiggled out of fear. But there was no way out of this. It pierced her skin. Her body shivering in pain. You pushed forward. Drilling. Shoving. Tearing. Until you felt the resistance of her spine. And then the instants it made contact with her bones, it happened. The woman's body convulsed. She screamed, but it was no longer in pain. Everybody could tell. It was as if the second the needle touched her bones, everything was turned upside down. Every neuron in her body fired. It was the most intense feeling she ever felt. Her eyes rolled back, foam pouring out of her mouth. This feeling was beyond bliss, beyond pleasure. Every millisecond felt like hours of pure ecstasy. From somewhere behind you, the imp from earlier approached. He was holding a bowl, shoving it under the woman's chin. You twisted your stinger, causing even more neurons to fire. She could feel it, her brain melting in the endless drowning river of pleasure. She clenched her teeth, inhaling through them, clenching so hard cracks appeared on them, some of them falling out, falling right next to the ball. As blood began seeping past her lips, she bit off a piece of her tongue, and yet she couldn't stop. She couldn't stop boning, screaming. Her movements became more erratic. And then, from one moment to the next, they ceased entirely. Limp, she sat there. A pink substance 
beginning to pour out of her eyes like tears. The bowl slowly catching the pink liquid as it slowly dripped out of the woman. Personality excretion, the heretical process of sealing oneself, it was permanent, irreversible, leaving the demon a mere husk. This was the power granted to you by hell. It was an ill mutation of memory parasites who were closest demonic relatives, biologically speaking. The overlords in the theater clapped for you, but... One. The little blonde girl next to Alistair, she was... vomiting into a barf bag. How cute. Reminded you a little of yourself. The first time you did this. Oh well. If Alistair had interest in her, she wouldn't need to get used to this. Vox was pleased with your performance. He leaned back in his chair patiently, sitting there for hours, just smiling. His eyes focused on the barely breathing, lifeless husk of the demoness that caused him so much grief. Mindlessly, her head was hanging low, drool coming out of her mouth. This woman had been a journalist who had snuck into the V-Tower hiding among Valentino's girls. During her capture, Vox had read all that there was she stole. Mostly blueprints of prototypes. Her text messages between herself and her boss described how they wanted to find out what information exactly Vox had collected off of demons. As well as possibly sell the blueprints for profit to either Camilla or Zestiel. Sure, the old-fashioned spider overlord didn't have much interest in terms of tech, but he definitely would understand that these blueprints were valuable. But also something else was among the writings. Vox's real name. Names had power in hell. Sure, not as powerful as portrayed in media, where knowing a demon's real name meant you could control them. But for Vox... His name being leaked could ruin his brand. He would no longer be Vox, he would just be some Joe Schmo, and that simply could not happen. He was Vox, the great and powerful TV demon. And so Vox had decided an execution was necessary. Thankfully, the other overlords agreed democratically. And so, things were set in motion. The husk blinked. Vox had promised the body to Val to use for his movies, so he graciously allowed the moth pimp to take it. After he was done gloating. With a smile of superiority, he watched the imp stagehand unshackled the demoness, packaging it up in a cardboard box, and then carrying it off stage. <sighs> Perhaps he should talk to you. That is, if you were still here. Of course, that's what he was hoping for, but as he entered the hallway with the actors' changing rooms, he found them empty, devoid of life. Hmm. Ugh. So he was the last one here, was he? He had been too caught up in his gloating. He didn't even notice anyone leaving. Such a shame. 
Vox made a mental note to seek you out as soon as possible. As per usual, you are floating in your indoor pool. In life, your family couldn't afford one. Not even one of those big put-together ones out of plastic that held like for two years and then broke. They even refused air conditioning due to the electricity bill. Of course you kept that mentality. You had lived in absolute poverty even though you made good money. Your entire family did. And when you died by being at the wrong place at the wrong time, by accidentally been in the crossfire of a gang drive-by, you were... mad. You had a full bank account while alive. Why didn't you live? You were just too scared to spend it. And so, once you became the Overlord's preferred little bioweapon, getting handouts from them to keep you entertained, to continue working for them, the first thing that you purchased were an apartment with an indoor pool and an air conditioning unit. Funny enough, people on the internet, your teachers, your parents, they always said money doesn't bring happiness, but... You would consider the fact that you spent most of your day floating in your pool while the AC kept your large loft at a comfy 20 degrees. To you, this was better than sex. Absentmindedly, you raised your right hand, holding up the middle finger, smiling a dumb smile. Sure, you were in hell, your parents in heaven, more than likely. But you had a goddamn pool and air conditioning. This was your peak. And as long as you kept killing, you'd stay here. And you'd kill for this. A sudden ringing of your doorbell got you finally out of your thoughts. Out of shock, your head was underwater for a moment. And then you huddled your way to the door, dripping wet splattering water all over your tiled flooring. Turning on the security camera, you saw... Vox? Knowing him, he could just teleport into the building using the energy supply as a way of travel. Him actively standing there, looking at you for the camera. That meant something. You owned the security door for him, while you stepped over to a towel, drying yourself, and finally Vox knocked on your door. Mentally prepping yourself, you opened it, and he looked at you with surprise. Uh, you're still swimming in your clothes? You're wearing a black cocktail dress. It was dripping wet. I like the weight. Uh, sure, sure. What do you want? You asked, while still stepping aside to allow him access. I haven't thanked you. You saved my ass, he said. You already paid me. It was a nice sum. Vox turned his head, giving you a certain look, and you crossed your arms. I mean, I wanted to personally thank you. He reached in his coat, pulling out a glass flask. He offered it to you. Taking it, you read the label. You weren't a pro when it came to identifying alcohol. So you were glad that he explained it. Personal favorite of mine. Uh, Bush Mills 20-year-old single malt Irish whiskey. I uh, was thinking we could drink it together. Your eye twitched and then widened slightly. Just enough for him to notice as you realized... You want a date? You said out loud, and Vox blushed, averting his gaze, causing you to swallow the comment you were about to make. This was probably Vox at his nicest. And this wasn't something to be underestimated. I... I... F fine. 
Voxy. Let's drink the night away together. You walked over to the center of your large loft where you had a white marble coffee table. There you placed the expensive whiskey bottle. I'll get my other stuff. This probably won't last us an hour. Sighing in relief, Vox sat down on your sofa. In hell, you learn quickly to not show vulnerability. As such, better respect it not to mention. He was very powerful, very influential. Don't upset him. And so you sat together, drinking and talking. It was surprisingly pleasant. And level-headed, <laughs> at least at the start. Aside from the conversation topics, of course, they were rather dark. But he was honest. There was no need to hide anything from you. You were, after all... You were, after all, Blackwall, the executioner. You didn't question. You followed. But it was all thanks to your ceaseless emptying of the whiskey bottle and the various liquors you had, which you had mostly purchased because of the funny colors rather than actual taste. So it was also a discovery of favors for you, as you never intended to drink any of these. They were absolutely vile, and you yearned for the taste of the whiskey again. The stuff was... A matured combination of hand-selected Oroso sherry butts and eggs bourbon, combining rich aromas of honey, summer fruits and sweet hazelnuts, as well as a hint of cocoa. It truly was a delight. Burned quite well while going down as well. <laughs> and... As a date like this usually went, over time, the both of you somehow found themselves naked in your pool. The alcohol having heated up your bodies by quite a lot, so the water was refreshing. Feeling strangely soft with the buzz all around your body, like a cooled blanket. Of course, Vox took much more to be drunk. Maybe he was taking advantage of you. Maybe he was too far gone himself. He did drink much more than you. Vox had enjoyed all of your collection. While you spit out whatever you could without him noticing. Ugh, this stuff was gross. <laughs> And my Keller, Lumbled Box, you have such an easy time disposing of good at trash. I have to do so much fucking work to silence people. He sighed. <laughs> but don't you have me on your payroll? It's just. No one is allowed to own you, killer. And I really, really want that soul of yours. A lot of overlords want that soul of yours. He was right. Like your brethren, the memory parasites, you weren't allowed to sell your soul or make soul contracts. This way, you would not gain power, nor could your power be controlled and abused. The only thing others had over you was money. That was what made your world go round. Vox leaned back and sighed, pleased. Hey, that's why I like you so much. The one plaything I will never own. You smirked, placing a hand on his thigh. Well, you might not own me, Voxy. I observed you, now in thought. But that just means you need to put just a tiny bit more effort into it. To make me do what you want, that is. He put a hand on your chin, pushing your ears up with his middle finger just a tiny bit. Oh really? 
How far would you say I have gotten by now to have you subservient to me? You licked your lips. Well, I suppose far enough for me to... He reached for his groin, causing him to jolt, blush, and hum. Do this. Hello. You waited around him in the water, placing your hands next to his legs. Don't worry, Voxy. I'm quite good at holding my breath. You winked at him, and Vox's eyes widened as your head went underwater. Thank you for watching my video until the very end. And I would like to remind you to please like and subscribe and comment something down below. I read every comment you write to me and I try to re reply to them as often as I can. But before we say goodbye, I would like to shout out all of my lovely darling stewards who so graciously support my third tier membership. Husky HD 17, Hopeful, Castea Misery, Bree, Zoe, Ikea, Mystic Jade 111, Annabelle R. Contreras, Giovanni Moriarty, Twilight Mia, Angry Boxman, Hella, Bit Bit, Melofia, Anonymous Weep, and Nicodemus D. Thank you so much for your continued support. And finally, I'd like to thank all of my lovely darling mates for also supporting me financially. I couldn't do this without you. Thank you very much for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a nice day. And please remember to like and subscribe.